AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler talked about the role of unions and her efforts to grow union membership and influence. The Christian Science Monitor hosts the hour-long discussion. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to call the meeting to order here. Um, my name is Mark Trumbull, and I'm the economy editor of the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, welcome, and especially welcome to our guest. Uh, today's guest is Liz Schuler of the AFL CIO. She's the president of the Labor Federation. And uh, we're very glad to have you with us again as another Labor Day weekend rolls around. Um, a little background, President Schuler grew up in a union household. Her father was a uh, power lineman and longtime member of the Electrical Workers Local 125 at Portland General Electric in Oregon. And her mother worked in the company's service and design department. Ms. Schuler attended the University of Oregon, and I might insert my own go ducks uh, <laughs> phrase here since uh, that's the alma mater of my father in law. Oh, uh, uh, during college, Ms. Schuler worked summers uh, at the electric company, and I would say that her life since then is testament that there can be a future for people who earn journalism degrees. <laughs> so, uh, <Touché. laughs> uh, after graduation, she returned to Portland General Electric to organize workers uh, who were in non-unionized clerical roles, like her mother's. Uh, she then went on to lead other organizing efforts uh, for the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers in both Oregon and California. In 2009, she became the first woman to serve as AFL-CIO Secretary-Treasurer, the Federation's number two official. And now she stands as the first woman to be elected president of the AFL-CIO in the organization's roughly 66-year history. Again, welcome, and, and now just some brief ground rules. Uh, we're on the record here. Please also no live blogging or tweeting. In short, no filing of any kind until the breakfast is over. Uh, once the session ends at about 10 o'clock, there is no embargo. And we'll email a rough transcript from this breakfast to all reporters uh, here shortly after we conclude. Uh, as many of you know, if you'd like to ask a question, you can send me a signal and I'll uh, call on you uh, in order. Uh, now, President uh, Schuler, if you would like to make some brief opening remarks, we'd uh, welcome that. The floor is yours. Terrific. Wow. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks to the Christian Science Monitor for hosting this. This is now an annual thing for me as well. I know for a long time um, our my predecessor, Rich Trumka, also did this breakfast. Many of you knew. Um, it was, I think, my first or second week um, as president last year when I attended this breakfast. Uh, so I was what they call a deer in headlights at that moment. Uh, but this year we're in a very different place and uh, I want to thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I want to thank all the working people in the room that are working behind the scenes who are making this breakfast happen as well. Um, and you know this is an incredible moment to be leading the American labor movement. Um, it's the honor of my life. It is very, very personal for me. And Mark, you alluded to my family story, but um, my family story is similar to so many families where it really was union membership that actually created the stability and a pathway to a better life uh, for me and my family. Um, my dad grew up in a one-room fruit picking shack in Hood River, Oregon. Um, he and his four siblings often went hungry. Um, right after graduating from high school, he enlisted in the Marine Corps and he went straight to Vietnam. And when he came back, he returned to Oregon. Um, he found a job as a hole digger 
back when the days power poles were actually the holes were dug by hand, right? Um, uh, at Portland General Electric, as you mentioned. Uh, but it was a power lineman's apprenticeship that put him on the path to a good union job. And that changed everything. Uh, in one generation, our family had a roof over our head, enough to eat, such a different experience than what my father had growing up. And I would say that is the power of a union. Um, that's what IBW 125 meant to my family. And from my dad, I would say that I learned the value of a union card. Uh, my mom, as you heard, also worked at the company, Portland General Electric. Uh, and I worked there, and we were both clerical workers. We didn't have a union, the power linemen did. And that difference was what showed me that in addition to good pay and good benefits, that it also meant dignity, it meant respect, it meant having a voice, being heard. Um, and that's how I got my start. And you mentioned we started organizing clerical workers at the company. And it really is about having one-on-one -on -one conversations, which we're hearing so much about these days, uh, the importance of, of talking to each other face-to-face. -face. That's what union organizing is. And many of the women that I worked with, um, the clerical workers, that's, that's what we did. We started having one-on-one -on -one conversations about a fair workplace. So that's where I got my start. And I learned how to organize from my mom because she was one of the fiercest organizers. She actually got called to the CEO's office for a one-on-one -on -one captive audience meeting during that drive. Um, but I say all that to fast forward to this moment today. Uh, it's a, a historic moment for organizing in this country. Millions of people want to join a union and they're organizing unions across industries across this country. And there have been historic investments in clean energy, technology, infrastructure. We're coming off this wave of lots of activity in Congress. Um, that's going to lead to a competitive economy, sustainable environment, and the promise of good quality jobs. And our democracy is at a crossroads. Will we build a more inclusive and responsive democracy? Or will we allow ourselves to be divided? And so for each of these opportunities and challenges, there is one response, one constant, and it's unions. And since I was here last, you may remember we had Striketober, um, where workers everywhere from Nabisco to John Deere were rising up. They were using their collective power on the picket line to ask for more. And the momentum has only built from there. And for every story you hear about working people organizing and joining together to form unions at Amazon or Starbucks, there are six or seven or more stories in other industries. Uh, so just this summer, over a hundred nurses at a hospital in Coral Gables, Florida organized. REI workers in the Bay Area won their union election. Sheet metal workers and painters have organized in shipyards in Alaska and Louisiana. Aircraft mechanics in North Carolina. 550 researchers at Mount Sinai Medical School have organized a union in New York City. 500 auto workers in Michigan won their union. 200 hotel workers in Austin, Texas won an organizing drive. Hundreds more in places you would never expect. Museums, cultural workers in Los Angeles, Baltimore, New York. Even hundreds of workers in the, what is a new and emerging industry, the cannabis industry. I always get a little snicker when I mention the cannabis industry. And I'm from Oregon, so yes, I know it well. But um, the, they uh, have come together to form unions, right? Um, this is so unexpected, so surprising. And it just shows that there is no industry or workplace that a union doesn't belong. It's every type of job. And working people, the reason they're organizing and, and numbers are so high is because they're tired of being called essential one minute coming out of this pandemic, we heard it all the time, and then treated as expendable the next. They're tired of working more and getting less in return. While their bosses collect bigger paychecks, 
and buy rockets. They're also connecting the dots and realizing that together they have the power to fight back. They don't have to just sit back and take it. And in fact, Gallup just released their latest polling. You all probably know this. I'm in a room of very, you know, well-educated and up-to-speed people. But that poll found that a record high 71% of people in this country support unions. So I have to tell you, when I'm on picket lines or I'm talking to organizers, there is an energy and a drive unlike we have seen among working people uh, in a generation. And what keeps me going every day is hearing from them and bringing their voices into these conversations and keeping my finger on the pulse of what working people are thinking and feeling. And so we need in this moment to bring as many people as possible from the margins of the economy to the center, um, making sure that women and people of color are helping drive our agenda because they are the future of our workforce. And we need to build a labor movement that is as modern and dynamic as our workplaces are. And the needs of working people are gonna be different as work is changing and technology evolves. We, the labor movement, have to evolve with it. And we have to grow the number of people in unions so that working people are driving the future, not just CEOs. And that's why growing the labor movement is the first goal. Coming out of our convention last June, we announced the Center for Transformational Organizing. We call it the CTO. And our baseline goal is to organize a million new workers because we know that growing the number of people in unions is going to create that power balance that we need to fix our broken economy. And the CTO is gonna be the place, the center of gravity, where we make those plans for growth together, uh, where we're bringing the power of all of our unions and landing on specific goals. And it's where we'll get out of our silos and, and build a movement that is taking on uh, very specific goals together. And particularly in non-union areas of the economy, like gig work, like Amazon, like the clean energy economy. And we're also taking that same all-in approach on organizing to our political work. And I know everyone here is anxious to talk about the, the election, right? Um, but we have been in the business of one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face conversations since our inception. And people are recognizing, thank you so much, the power of those tactics that really in this moment where everyone is so polarized and so divided, the only way you break through is by talking to each other. Sounds so old, it's new. And that's the way you break through the noise. So when it comes to the 2022 midterms, we're not only in our sweet spot because we know how to do this, but we are uniquely positioned to make a winning difference because we aren't have this infrastructure that no one else has. We have a network of state AFL-CIOs, local CL, uh, central labor councils of the AFL-CIO in every zip code in this country. So we're taking that network and we're turning it up to 11, as they say. Um, working people are reclaiming our power everywhere from the workplace to the ballot box. We are organized and we are ready to win. So with that, I appreciate the time and look forward to having a conversation. Wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll start with a question or two and then we'll, we'll open it up. Uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, health of our democracy being at stake and I wonder, this is kind of a broad question, but uh, what do unions, what can they bring, what can you bring that connects the dots from economic health of workers to the political health of our country. How do you see that working? And as part of that, is there something to do with the fact that the middle class seems to be smaller as a share of the whole society than it was way back, you know, 50 years ago? Well, we would argue that's because union density usually tracks um, the health of uh, working people in the economy, but your question is, is so timely because you're right, people are angry, they're frustrated, they're fed up 
because the economy is broken and that is translating right into our politics um, and we're seeing that that frustration manifest itself in um, in in the way people respond in elections and so we would say that unions are a pillar of a healthy democracy and we see it around the world that um, unions have always been sort of bedrock and to the foundation of a healthy economy and a healthy society and so as unions um, get stronger our democracy gets stronger and so our fundamental role and responsibility is to educate our members and all working people frankly um, about how to uh, right the scales or balance the scales in the economy by coming together collectively mm -hmm. and that when you come together collectively you have more power both in your workplace and your ability to influence those decisions that are made on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. and so I think we saw that demonstrated in this last uh, year alone with the investments that have been made um, you know in Congress it's because working people demanded it in the last election they made it very clear what they were looking for they wanted more investments in clean energy to grow a, a you know stable future and uh, create good jobs they wanted investments in things like our health care and, and safety and health on the job and coming out of this pandemic it couldn't be more important uh, so I think they are deeply connected that the labor movement again uniquely positioned to reach real working people in actual workplaces all across this country in every state and every community we can be the messengers we can be a trusted source for information and help people connect those dots between what they're feeling their frustrations and actually how to make the change that they so desperately want mm -hmm. in their politics mm -hmm. okay and then uh, a follow-up you mentioned the strong polling numbers of your favorability overall and yet uh, you know <laughs> there's a lot fewer people in unions than there used to be is there something that unions themselves need to do better to uh, to make this case that you're making that it's it's time to rebuild them <laughs> well we're always looking in the mirror obviously trying to um, be more effective and more relevant to working people and what they need and, and what they deserve especially as the workplace is changing and um, we need to be more dynamic and modern and inclusive to reflect the changes that are happening in the workplace but I also believe that uh, the fundamentals of our labor laws are so broken that that's mostly the root of the issue why so many people want and support unions but yet have trouble joining them mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, the law of the land the National Labor Relations Act encourages unionization it is a fundamental right in this country to be able to join a union freely mm -hmm. however that law has been chipped away at over time and it's been tilted in favor of corporations who don't want to see people form unions because they perceive it as a threat to their ability to run their business or their bottom line so what we need is to reform our labor laws so that it actually gets back to the spirit of the National Labor Relations Act and gives people the the rights that they deserve and the voice that they deserve in the workplace uh, to be able to freely join unions so that if you see you know a, a partner at Starbucks that they're truly treated as a partner and enabled to form a union uh, and so our um, the legislation we've been backing called the PRO Act for uh, a number of years we talked about it last year of course does that uh, it reforms the law so that it um, makes uh, the intimidation tactics and the hostile environment that companies create illegal so that uh, employees aren't forced to sit and listen to anti-union propaganda against their will <laughs> um, they're not uh, fired for the basic exercising those basic rights um, which we see in campaign after campaign after campaign and I think um, I'm so glad that the that you all are covering Starbucks and Amazon the way you are because it has really brought shined a light on the tactics that have been happening for decades um, the fact that there are union busting consultants hired to um, you know harass people intimidate them um, and uh, we've seen it time and time again so I think um, labor law reform is the key ingredient here um, to enable people to 
join unions without fear. And of course, we are constantly looking for the labor movement um, to be more responsive to the needs of working people as we modernize our economy. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. Well, now we'll go uh, first to Niels uh, Lisniewski of CQ Roll Call. Thank yeah. you. Um, and again, rather predictably, perhaps, uh, it is a bit of a political question. Um, the president is going to um, Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania on Monday, on Labor Day, for labor-related events. Uh, something you said about how you're, you're having success in organizing in places that are not traditionally where you would think they would be, uh, leads me to the question of how do you deal with the likelihood that the membership of the unions in some of these places, where there are not traditionally unions, may not be Democrats. They may not be people who would traditionally be Biden voters or people who you're going to GOTV for Democrats in November. How do you deal with the membership that may not look politically, their, their other political positions may not entirely align with what with, with the labor movement's goals are at the federal level? Well, that is a question that I think speaks to the moment we're in in our country where, you know, we have a lot of divergent views and in fact we're pretty polarized as a country. Um, I would say the labor movement's membership, you know, kind of tracks similarly. Like we have members that certainly will disagree with uh, candidates that perhaps have been endorsed at the local level. Um, but those are dem uh, democratic processes, right? So that it's um, the members on the ground that actually make those decisions. They deliberate based on the issues and where candidates stand. And that's the one thing I hope you take away is that we're, we are an issues-driven organization. Uh, we don't put candidates first, we put workers first. And we look through the lens of working people when we're identifying the issues that we measure those candidates against. And it happens to be that President Biden, who is a Democrat, has been very much a pro-union president. So we are proud of the uh, track record that he has had and his administration has had. Um, and that translates down at every level, um, you know, from city council to Congress and uh, the United States Senate. It. It's um, through an issues-based lens. So what I would say to a member that perhaps is unhappy that a Democrat is endorsed is to look at what's underneath that. Look beyond the party label and look at the issues that we are measuring against. And so is that candidate supporting raises in the minimum wage? Is that candidate supporting stronger safety and health protections, uh, OSHA protections? You know, is that candidate actually supportive of collective bargaining and, and forming unions? And that's usually where we fall off, right? Is that many Republicans disagree with the fundamentals of collective bargaining and being in a union. And so how do you support candidates that disagree with your very existence? Um, so what we try to do is be very objective and, and an issues-based approach, and we can talk more about that as we go here, but we are taking a different approach this year in that we aren't uh, flying in, you know, from the, the national level and, and basically trying to land on a community and and um, push a particular brand of political program. We're actually doing the reverse. It's more of a grassroots effort that then influences what we do nationally because it's driven around issues and really listening to our members and what are the issues that they care about. Not what we think in Washington, D.C. they should care about, but locally. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that that actually reinforces um, you know, the strength of those endorsements because they will be deliberated on based on the issues that are um, driven locally. I just, I'm first to David uh, Shepherdson from Reuters. Oh. And then, yeah. Thanks for doing this, Liz. Uh, two, two questions for you. One, I want to follow up on your, your comment about trying to organize a million new members. That'd be a pretty big number, right? Because I think, according to BLS, the number of union members nationally is around 15 million or something has gone down in the last few years. Can you talk it's about over that? 10 years. Right. Okay, it's over go 10 ahead. years. Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks. That's all. And 
two sectors that are there's a big push on unionization: clean energy. You know, the new battery plants which yes. are spreading up everywhere. You know, the UAW is aggressively trying to organize. You know, both the plants at the Detroit Three are coal building as well as the, the transplants. Can you talk about what sort of efforts you're you're doing to try to encourage that? And then also on the on the, the airline front, right? You know, Delta is Delta. There's efforts to organize Delta, and a lot of consternation among airline employees about what a rough summer they've had. Oh my, yes. Um, so yes, we are. Um, the first question I got the batteries, Delta. What was the first part again? Oh, just on, oh, on that was on the one year, the one million. Workers. Oh yeah, CTO. Um, so thanks for clarifying that. And when we uh, convened in Philadelphia a couple months ago, we launched our Center for Transformational Organizing. Um, I met with our key leader, union leaders to figure out what would be a realistic goal to set a floor, not a ceiling. I just want to make that clear. And so a million new members also is the key. Um, over 10 years means about 100,000 a year. Uh, and we're putting that out there so that we can hold ourselves accountable, um, which, you know, we, we don't normally do. And, and I wanted to be bold so that we put something out there for us to actually aspire to together. And that's the difference, is that we're bringing unions together in a, in a single strategy to land on industries that will benefit the entirety of the labor movement. We know Amazon, for example, has a footprint in not just packaging and warehouse and delivery, but media, prescription drugs, you know, transportation. It's a massive company uh, in pretty much every industry that has a ripple effect across the economy. So uh, clean energy economy is the same, where we have, um, you know, such tremendous opportunity to grow good union jobs in an industry that is non-union for the most part, low wage uh, at this moment. Um, but it's up to us to actually lift those standards and bring people together in new and creative ways so that we can make the clean energy industry like the auto industry, right? Which started out as um, dangerous jobs with low pay and horrible safety conditions, organized a union, elevated those standards. We want to do the same with the clean energy economy. And it's going to benefit everyone. Um, so that million uh, member goal is a floor, not a ceiling. We will um, bring together the best organizers and researchers and um, technologists into our organizing strategies uh, and go to work. Uh, so that's, uh, to me, one of the most exciting things that came out of our convention. And there's unity around those goals. That's the other key, that we all are all in. It's not just one union taking on one company. It's all unions banding together um, you know, to make a difference. Um, in terms of batteries, you're absolutely right. Um, Again, huge opportunities coming out of um, the IRA and uh, the infrastructure legislation and the CHIPS Act uh, to really reclaim domestic manufacturing as an industry that is driving good jobs. And with the labor standards that we have in the legislation uh, to make sure that we're not low-roading these investments, our tax dollars should be used to create good jobs. Um, and the battery is the new combustion engine. And uh, you know, a lot of the skills that we see uh, that have traditionally been in the auto industry, we believe will transfer to the way this industry grows and emerges uh, over time and that we have the potential to create um, you know, a good high road, high wage future that is family sustaining in the clean energy uh, and EV, specifically EV industry. And so the AFL-CIO is actually working with the UAW and a number of our unions uh, to see if we can, and, and our, um, you know, uh, folks in the administration, to see if we can bring together almost a tripartite approach to a high road solution where we can get some of the companies who are manufacturing and who will, um, you know, take that ESG commitment seriously and, and I, you know, the, make the S part of that ESG real um, and come to the table and then we can forge a solution as a country about how do we want to tackle this, this clean energy economy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then finally on Delta, I would say, um, you know, again, all in <laughs> the entire labor movement, landing on the organizing campaign. Um, the AFA has been waging uh, with Delta, and we have uh, the machinists also partnering um, with the flight attendants because that company is an outlier. They're one of the only non-union um, companies in the airline industry uh, where their flight attendants continue to be non-union. And you see the tactics. They're responding. They've hired union-busting firms. They're putting millions of dollars into uh, anti-union uh, tactics. And every once in a while, they see an issue that flight attendants are upset about, and then they try to fix it and do that you know, proactively to undermine the organizing campaign, right? Because they will give... Uh, um, give a raise or um, you know the pay that they instituted for um, the idle time or the time people are uh, when they're boarding the flights um, so I think the bottom line is that we're coming together as a labor movement to support organizing wherever it happens um, and that um, this is the moment because we have so much momentum the public is pro-union the administration is the most pro-union administration in history, and we have working people standing up, taking risks, tremendous courage against the odds because of our broken labor laws, willing to say, you know what, enough is enough. I'll go uh, to Kirk Beto of National Journal, and then over to Riley and others. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, what are your priorities at the federal level if Democrats keep control of Congress after the midterms, and then how are those priorities change if Republicans take back the House? Well, we've had um, the last you know couple of years, we've been in a proactive posture where we've put forward a lot of legislative ideas and proposals and been on offense uh, because we have a, a pro-worker um, majority uh, you know in in both the House and Senate and in the White House so it's been a, an unusual feeling I will admit that we didn't have to be on defense as much which obviously if um, you know things change in November we have to recalibrate our strategy uh, I don't think the priorities change though I mean we're giving voice to working people on a whole host of issues that are pretty evergreen um, and that is always you know looking at um, are the investments that our government is making going to create good jobs um, we've seen a lot for example with investments in uh, technology that's been an area of growth that traditionally hasn't had a union voice at the table and so that's something we'd like to continue to push hard to change and in fact um, we have great examples now with the chips act since we did have a pro-worker majority in congress where we were actually able to get labor a seat at the table so when those investments are um, uh, trickling down to the community level that um, we have uh, a worker voice in how that will be shaped. Um, we have partnerships that we now have a door open to with companies who are building chips that we want to partner and provide training to make sure they have the most highly skilled, highly trained workforce. We're partnering with uh, Carnegie Mellon University um, to make sure that there's a worker voice and perspective in things like AI and robotics. So this is an area of growth for the labor movement that I think um, we will continue to keep our eyes on as um, you know, Congress We'll see how it shakes out in November, but um, certainly we will spend quite a bit of time on defense, I have a feeling, where um, most of the gains that we made in this last Congress, um, there'll be attempts to roll back. Uh, there'll be attempts to institute things like right to work, um, uh, cuts to funding for OSHA and the National Labor Relations Board and the enforcement agencies that um, have actually been looking through a worker's lens when they approach their work. So um, we've seen it before, we've endured. Um, we're not going to stop fighting for working people and the issues they care about, and that doesn't, you know, depend on who's in control of Congress. It just um, we keep going to work every day and bringing their voices forward. Yeah, thanks. 
Riley Began, uh, Detroit News. Yeah, so I have two questions. Um, one follow-up to, to David's is, you know, the the EV economy has been popping up in these states like Georgia and Tennessee and Kentucky, where there's a lot of political and cultural resistance to unionization. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how the labor movement can overcome that and get actual gains there. Um, and then my second question is, how might sort of the discussion about a potential recession impact um, the momentum and sort of organizing efforts that you discussed at the top? Yeah, well, I have to applaud the UAW for their forward-looking posture. Um, you know, Ray Curry, of course, as president and his investments in organizing, particularly in the South, have started to pay off. Um, I know they just recently had, um, you know, a convening that brought workers from all um, kinds of companies in the South, union, non-union, to start thinking about how they could work together more closely. Um, and you know, we as a labor movement are investing more in the South. So you can imagine that there's a softening of the ground when you have more people. Um, you know, talking about unions, investing in infrastructure, um, forming those community partnerships and alliances uh, that people, I think, recognize when you have more union jobs, it lifts up entire communities. Uh, it raises the, the standard um, for wages uh, for, you know, it has that ripple effect across the economy. Um, so the auto industry specifically has always played that role. Uh, and we want to see that continue to happen in the South right to work states are tough um, but it doesn't mean that workers <laughs> sit on the sidelines right and and from what we're seeing um, you know the Amazon election in Bessemer Alabama for example we came so close in a right to work state that has never happened um, and I always say that if that election were held in New York City we would have two Amazon unions um, but you know they're still organizing on the ground there and sometimes it takes because labor laws are so broken and there's so much stacked against workers it takes one two three four five tries to actually um, to get the union that that the workers need and deserve um, and so that's still happening in Bessemer and I think that that's a case study for how um, we can apply that kind of collaboration to the auto sector which is obviously growing um, by the day and um, you know also the CTO will be um, a great place for us to strategize and when I say clean energy economy that includes the batteries and EVs because um, you know that's a key part of that clean energy future so inevitably that means we're, we're bringing 57 unions resources and strategies and organizers to bear um, for these campaigns and that hasn't happened in the past um, you know Nissan for example um, didn't have the full breadth and scope of the labor movement like it could or should have um, and I think that that's a culture shift that we're seeing that unions are um, less worried about people you know kind of looking behind the curtain at their organizing strategies because they have such specialized expertise you know we're now more open to each other's ideas and bringing strengths and best practices and um, you know literal organizers to the table um, so I think that's really exciting that will have a big impact on um, what we're seeing in the south um, and then in terms of a recession um, you know obviously we've been through this before cyclical uh, changes in the economy um, and we prepare for them uh, and I think um, unfortunately what we're seeing with the Fed where um, you know Jerome Powell is continuing to raise interest rates and saying well it's just going to be painful. Sorry, working people, you're going to just have to endure it. Is a big mistake. Um, we have been patient. We've, you know, been working hard for the past 30, 40 years with uh, real wages being stagnant, essentially. Um, just now, have we seen um, with the labor market tightening uh, the ability for workers to have that courage and that. Um, that security, you know, that more secure feeling that they can actually stand up and take a risk. Um, so I don't think that's going to stop um, because, as I said earlier, working people are waking up to their power. They're 
fed up, they're fired up, they're um, ready to make change, and they're finally connecting the dots that the labor movement is the place to do that. And so I don't think that's going to slow down. And I think that we're going to continue to see people waking up to this notion that coming together collectively is how we rebalance the scales. Um, particularly, you know, people are angry at what they're seeing with these record profits coming out of the pandemic and companies making billions of dollars and then not being able to afford very modest wage increases uh, for their workers. And so um, I think that that's, that's just going to continue. Uh, Paul Bedard, Washington Examiner, and then over to Ramsey. Let me bounce off your comment on the Fed. I hadn't thought about that, but on on the president in his first year and in, in, in uh, uh, his budget documents and uh, other things, he put a big focus on hiring union workers uh, for government jobs. Clearly, and you've said he's the best partner possibly that unions have had uh, ever. What has been the impact of that, especially if you look at your, your 100,000 that you want to get this year? Yeah. Has Biden really done anything to help that? And then what about inflation and the recession and any advances you may have made or now we're all kind of feeling it, we're, we're, we're starting to feel like we're falling, falling backwards. What pressure have you or will you put on the administration to uh, uh, help your folks out? So the impact that we have felt from the Biden administration's policies, it's, you know, it's a big ship, right? And it takes time to, to turn it around, but they've already made incredible progress, even within the federal government, as you mentioned, with the appointments they've made. Secretary of Labor, a card-carrying union member. Uh, who's been out on picket lines, who's been out, you know, trying to problem solve. Frankly, as a lot of people don't realize that Secretary Walsh actually is probably talking to business uh, almost as much as he's talking to labor. And he actually has great relationships across the aisle and with companies. Um, but to have someone who's waking up every morning looking through the lens of working people in that role is a huge shift. And I would say that that has carried over in most of the appointments, you know, throughout the the federal government, cabinet secretaries, you know, the regulatory approach that they take, uh, the rulemaking, you know, always inviting a worker perspective to the table, you know, thinking through the, like, you know, the mind of a working person. Um, the White House Task Force on Worker Empowerment, a lot of people have never heard of it because it's never been done before and people are kind of trying to get their arms around it, but what it was designed to do was to say, what can we do within the federal government to promote unionization? You know, what can we do in the policies on, on procurement? Um, how can we behave, how can our agencies behave in a way that is more pro-union? Um, so they put one report out, the next report is due out any day, um, on a whole series of recommendations that um, they've already started to, to implement. Um, so those are kind of the inside the beltway things, but outside the beltway, really where the rubber meets the road is on these investments. The fact that there are labor standards written into the law that mean that when infrastructure dollars go out the door, that there's going to be prevailing wages attached to those investments that mean you're going to actually create family sustaining jobs and they're going to be in communities where um, you know people who have traditionally been left behind people of color women um, young people will have more opportunities and we are working hand in glove at the community level to make sure that happens we often see ourselves in the labor movement as the enforcers right that we interpret the law and make sure that it lands the way it's supposed to and that it's benefiting the people that it should um, so if Infrastructure is a great example. Um, I mentioned the CHIPS Act, and you know we're so desperate to manufacture in this country. It's a competitiveness issue for our country um, to be able to make the things that we need, especially in times of crisis. Um, not just semiconductors, but think about the pandemic and how we didn't even have ventilators that you know enough for our healthcare workers. And what did we do? We pivoted, and in fact, the auto workers recalibrated a plant to make ventilators. And so it was like healthcare workers and auto workers working together to get through this crisis. Um, so that kind of innovation, that kind of um, nimbleness and um, 
you know, ability to pivot is what we think the hallmark of a modern labor movement looks like, and um, that will help get us through. Absolutely. And until we get the PRO Act passed, there, it will be difficult to unleash massive union growth because our labor laws are so stacked against workers. But we don't wait for Congress. We don't wait for the president. Workers are out there demanding change and rising up and forming unions regardless. Um, and so we're seeing that momentum. And you know, when I talk to workers that um, have just formed unions, no matter if it's Starbucks, if it's um, REI or a museum worker, the issues are the same. They're talking about respect. They're talking about dignity. They're talking about decent wages and health care and benefits, but they're also talking about toxic work environments coming through the pandemic, how they're being treated by customers, how they're being treated by their bosses. Um, you know, the fact that they sometimes feel voiceless in the decision making. Uh, predictable schedules, that is a huge issue. Um, you know, their rights as workers and having a seat at the table. So those are the things that have, that seem to drive every worker that I've been talking to in every industry, no matter if it's, you know, industries you might not expect, like video game developers that are unionizing or workers that you know have been on strike because they've been in a union a long time like bakery workers who <laughs> I think I said last time you know we we're all sitting on our couches eating snacks Oreos and Ritz crackers those workers were working 24 hours time away from their families I was on the picket line with bakery workers with their children I'm getting kind of emotional who were like I have not seen my dad because he's been working so much. Like, I can't wait for this strike to be over so that we can get back to some sense of normalcy. I um, actually was riding in a car with um, a letter carrier who had been working 12 hour days, six days a week, for two and a half years. Because, you know, that's what we do. We, we step up through, you know, times of crisis. And during the pandemic, what happened? Mail volume went up, right? Because everybody's getting their goods delivered to their houses. And so it falls on the backs of the working people who actually are having to work those shifts to make sure that those packages get delivered, that people get their medications, that the ballots get delivered on time. You know, it's essential work. And they should be compensated accordingly. And then on Biden, pressure on him or somebody to make sure they're getting paid fairly. He's the most pro-union president, but we hold him accountable too. And we don't always disagree. I don't think that gets covered as much, right, when we disagree. But we absolutely hold every elected official uh, to the same standard that are you sticking up for working people? Are you following the laws? Are you putting that worker protection um, into the, the drafts? Are you, you know, enforcing the regulations as they were written? Um, but yeah, we definitely will be um, making sure that we continue to press um, both our friends in office and those who haven't stood by us. Ramsey Touchberry, uh, Washington Times. Thank you. Um, two brief questions. Uh, the first being you mentioned having to sort of recalibrate the strategy if Republicans uh, do well in the midterms. I'm wondering what exactly that looks like, especially if, um, you know, we do tip into a recession. You know, how do you get uh, Republicans who have been historically opposed to this movement, how do you get them to listen um, to what you're, you're putting out there? And second, um, you know, you talked about the president a lot and his, you know, pro-union stance. There's still some concern among Democrats that, especially with inflation, they could lose more blue-collar workers to Republicans in the midterm. So what is a level of concern that inflation or even a recession could hurt the labor movement and hurt the candidates that you all support that also support the labor movement? So I... I think I should be clear that we do support Republicans. Uh, we support the Republicans that actually are good on our issues and are pro-union. And in fact, there's been, I think, a conversation within the Republican Party about being more pro-worker. Um, you know, folks like Marco Rubio have sounded the alarms and said, this is a mistake if we think we're going to leave the so-called blue-collar worker behind, right? And that we shouldn't be make unions our enemies because a lot of the issues that working people care about 
should be issues that the Republican Party cares about. Um, so we do support Republicans that support us. Um, and I would say that um, you know a lot of what the Republicans base their decisions on is corporations and the corporations demand and policies uh, that they would like to see and often those are anti-union. Uh, so if we could kind of get underneath the fact that more corporations could actually choose to not fight working people and see unionization as a benefit to their businesses that we might have more people in the Republican Party see the benefits of um, you know unions as a solution instead of a threat um, because we're not going to close the inequality gap in this country if workers don't have more power to bargain together and we saw as you were saying you know this chart over time if you see kind of the wealth gap um, as inequality has risen it tracks union decline so that as unions got weaker you know that gap that yawning difference between what most people make and, and the one percent has increased um, and so if you look at um, just the basic demands of what working people are asking for um, most companies who want productive uh, a productive workforce and a successful company are starting to listen and I use Microsoft as an example where Brad Smith actually said you know what my workforce is talking about unionization maybe that's something that I should listen to instead of fight and so he signed a neutrality agreement with the communications workers of America for Activision Blizzard and I think you compare that posture to what Howard Schultz is doing at Starbucks and they're night and day and in fact you know you wonder the more you fight the more it incentivizes people to want to form a union you know because it's that um, that hostile behavior that um, anti-union animus that creates that toxicity in the workplace that makes workers less productive that makes them less likely to stay at the company um, and so we would argue that being in a union actually can improve your bottom line and that we can sit at a table and actually um, have conversations with each other and um, work through problems work through issues and you know you would ask some of our union employers why you know what's the benefit of having a union in their company they would tell you this is a way for me to systematize changes in the in the company and the culture and work to really get the workers perspective up front in the development process um, and things just go smoother so um, I think that that will have an impact on um, you know how our politics plays out in the future and um, in terms of the uh, recession and the impact on um, what that's going to mean for working class voters I think um, you know recession or no recession working people are essentially looking at who is standing with them um, who supports the issues that they support and the issues that we hear the most about are obviously wages but more importantly health care retirement security and um, toxic work environments you know the workplace quote culture issues that people are grappling with um, and so I think that is as I said universal no matter where you work and no matter what kind of job you have and that unions can be the solution um, for for working people in this country mm -hmm. We'll uh, go next over to this side of the table. Uh, <laughs> Noah Robertson with the monitor, and then Jeff or Joe. Sorry. When you mentioned earlier that you're glad there's been so much attention paid to the organization efforts at Amazon, Starbucks. Um, do you ever worry that that perhaps presents a sort of unrepresentative sample of the movement? Maybe uh, too much attention paid to road scholars at Starbucks and not to <laughs> partners or workers at REI. I would say no because um, to me it's showing people who have old stereotypes about unions that unions are for everyone and I think there has been you know a long-standing view that oh unions were relevant back when you know we had a manufacturing economy and you know people worked in unsafe conditions but now we have laws we don't need unions which is absolutely not true if you saw what we went through during the pandemic and you know workers 
crying out in the dark about unsafe conditions. Um, if you didn't have a union, often you would be fired if you spoke out. Um, but if you had a union, you could actually say, hey, wait a second, I shouldn't have to wear a garbage bag to respond to patients in a hospital. Um, so I think those um, issues, as I said, are universal. And if you're a Rhodes Scholar, you want respect and dignity on the job working at Starbucks. And if you're in an Amazon warehouse, you want to actually, um, you know, if the heat is um, too extreme, and people are fainting, you want to be able to speak out and not have to worry about losing your job or having too much time off task um, if, you, if you say something. Um, so I think it, uh, it is a representative sample. It's um, representing a shift in the way people view unions, um, the fact that they see unions as a pathway when most young people had never even heard of a union. Right, we've um, a lot of people don't know someone in a union. They don't know what they're what they are, how to form one. <laughs> so that's our challenge: is to take the 71 percent of you know people who are favorable and translate that into the ability for people to join unions and actually make a difference in whatever workplace they're in. And I was you know talking earlier, um, you know about how young people are approaching unionization is so different than some of their predecessors and um, you know there is a generational difference in perspective around what a union is and what it means um, you know digital journalists um, I'll pick on them um, are negotiating their company's carbon footprint in their collective bargaining agreement you know looking at corporate social responsibility as a um, um, subject of bargaining at the table and so I think there's innovation happening there that makes it more relevant to the folks you're talking about that you know may not have seen unions as relevant to them oh, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, Joseph Morton uh, Dallas Morning News thanks, thanks so much for doing this um, one to ask specific specifically about Texas large state um, going through a lot of demographic changes union membership numbers still low like a lot of states in the south unique challenges to uh, changing that in Texas and assuming we don't get the pro act passed in you know the next few weeks or whatever you know right. uh, what what how do you see that um, playing out in the future what what can you guys do to get get those numbers up and just where do things go in Texas on labor yeah and, and Texas of course a right to work state um, and traditionally, very high union uh, levels in you know heavy industry. Um, obviously, with the energy industry being so strong down there, we've got you know um, strong representation in those industries, but not so much in in other areas of the economy. And that has been something we've aspired to for years: is um, knowing that the demographics are changing of workers in Texas, and you know we have more workers of color, um, and for to make the connection again for them to see the labor movement as a movement for them um, so we'll deploy the CTO tactics uh, and strategies in um, you know pretty much every state where there's a footprint for the industries that I mentioned that you know we're really honing in on and Texas inevitably will be one of those states um, and we think that there's real opportunities there and um, with the clean energy economy um, that to me is just nothing but opportunity for the state of Texas. Well, and and I'm going to show you the clock. We've okay. This hour flew by quickly. Uh, As always, sorry. yes. Yeah, we didn't get I, to everyone, but I would love to ask more questions, and maybe others would too. So, uh, thank you so much for being with us, uh, President Schuler, and uh, wish everyone a uh, happy Labor Day. Happy Labor Day. <laughs> Try not to labor on Labor Day. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you probably will. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good to have you. Thank you. <clears throat> so people are tweeting already. Or <laughs> yeah. I know. It's very fun. Just find some of those non-traditional issues that younger workers are bring to light. Yeah. Are those are those potentially divisive, or do you get everybody's on board? We've tried to approach it with unity, um, find the economic connection because that's our lane. What is affecting people 
well and, and their ability to have a good job and earn a decent living. And you know, the issue of choice is an economic issue. So um, we've been able to, you know, travel um, looking through that lens. Um, but yeah, I think those issues are very much drivers, especially for this next generation. Um, but really, for all working people, um, we've been doing a lot of polling. Uh, within our membership to find out what the main issues are that are driving people and choice has shown up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. I took care of patients with a